This program is brought to you by Cable Franchise Vs and generous donations from viewers like you. Yes, I'm ready. Okay, and Sean, I can see that we are connected to Amherst Media. And are we allowing the attendees into the uh, conference? Yes. Okay. Then given that, I'm going to call the meeting to order. Um, Governor Baker's March 12th order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, general law, chapter 30A, paragraph 20, allows us to hold this virtual special joint meeting of the town council and school committee. I will call upon each candidate by name, then the members of the school committee, and then the members of the council. At that time, please unmute your mic and say present. This will indicate that you can hear me and we can hear you. Please remember to mute your mic after saying present. Gaston De La Reyes. Present. Ryan Driscoll. Present. Katie Lesdowski. Present. Heather Lord. Present. Moving to the school committee, Peter Demling. Present. Ben Harrington. Please unmute. Present, sorry. Thank you. Allison McDonald. Present. Harry Spitzer. Present. And now the town council, Shalini Balmilne. Shalini, unmute. Present, present. <laughs> Alyssa Brewer. Present. Pat DeAngelis. Present. Present. Mont. Darcy Dumont. Oh, sorry. Present. Lynn Griesmer is present. Mandy Jo Haneke. Present. Dorothy Pam. Present. Evan Ross. Present. George Ryan. Present. Kathy Shane. Present. Steve Schreiber. Present. Andy Steinberg. Present. Sarah Schwartz. Present. Given that we have a quorum of the town council present, I am calling the April 14th, 2020 meeting of the Amherst Town Council to order at 6.02 p.m. Allison McDonald, chair of the school committee, will now call the school committee to order. Given that we also have a quorum of the school committee present, I'm calling the April 14th, 2020 special meeting of the Amherst School Committee to order at 6.03 p.m. Okay. This meeting includes audio and video. It is being recorded and is available live on Amherst Media. There will be no public comment during this meeting. Candidates, school committee members, and town councilors, there is no chat room for this meeting. If you have technical issues, please let Sean or Athena know through the numbers that have been provided to you. If technical difficulties arise as a result of utilizing remote participation, I will decide how to address the situation. Discussion may be suspended while we address technical issues, and the minutes will note if a disconnection occurs. Athena and Sean will be monitoring candidates, school committee members, and town counselors um, to make sure their connections are working. And if necessary, we will pause the meeting until they are reconnected. The joint meeting will be resumed on Thursday, April 16th at 6 o'clock, only if technical difficulties prevent the completion of interviews and vote to select a candidate. I'm going to spend a little time just reviewing the process, so could you please put the slide up that shows the timeline for filling the vacancy?
Let me begin by saying the process of selecting a person to fill a vacancy on an elected body is described in the Amherst Home Rule Charter, Section 4.1c. The process leading up to tonight and this meeting tonight is consistent with that section of the charter. It has been vetted with both the town council and the school committee, and it appears as part of the packet for tonight's meeting. Very briefly, on February 21st, Eric Nakajima sent in his resignation. It was effective March 1st. On Monday, February 24th, the town council began discussion of this process and the school committee began a similar discussion on March 2nd. Both continued the, these discussions up to the point of publishing the set of questions. On Tuesday, March 3rd, the notice of the vacancy was posted and a description of the Amherst School Committee responsibilities and expectations. On March 31st at four o'clock, the nomination or the candidate statements were due and certification of a person as a resident who is a registered voter began. And on Friday, um, April 3rd, we posted their names as well as the first portion of the meeting packet along with the statements of interest and those certifications. On April 8th, we mailed packets to the candidates, all members of the town council and the school committee including those certifications and their statements of interest, the process and timeline, the announcements of the vacancies and of the candidates, the Amherst School Committee description and the question, questions for candidates. This brings us to tonight. Allison McDonald, Chair of the School Committee and I will ask the candidates questions. We will do that in alphabetical and rotating order. At the completion of the interview, we may take a five minute break. After that, the school committee members and the town council may wish to speak to candidates' qualifications in relationship to the published description of the board's responsibilities and expectations. But we ask that you not express which candidate you intend to vote for. The winning candidate requires a majority of votes of the remaining filled seats on both boards. Absences and abstentions at the meeting do not affect this requirement. Therefore, the number of votes required for a successful candidate is nine. We will then proceed to a roll call vote, starting with the school committee and then the town council. This will be done in alphabetical and rotating order for each group. If on the first roll call vote, no candidate receives the required number of votes, then the process will be repeated until a candidate receives the majority of the votes as defined above. The council, president, and the chair of the school committee may choose to insert a period of comment after each round of votes. And after the vote is completed, there will be a motion to ap appoint the winning candidate. So we will begin the opening statements and questions and the closing statements. Allison McDonald will join me in asking the questions. And so uh, we will begin. Uh, and I believe you can take the screen down now so the candidates can be seen as they're answering their questions. Thank you. Sean, have you made that arrangement on the Zoom that they'll be seen as on the screen? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, so we'd like to start with opening remarks. The order for this round of the opening remarks starts with Gaston, then Ryan, then Katie, then Heather. I hope it's fine that I've called you by your first names. So please, shall we begin, Gaston? Uh, you're not, you're muted. Okay. Thank you. Very good. Uh, thank you so much for the opportunity. I'm here to answer the call for service. I understand my job today is to convey the skills, experience, approach, and values that I bring to the school committees. Uh, my most relevant experience is serving over a decade on school boards, including boards responsible for the oversight of school directors, as well as PGOs. Uh, why did I answer this call? Uh, I became heavily involved in DC as a community liaison and then chair of the school's PGO, my children's Spanish immersion public school. And this led me to many meetings with city councilors, school district leadership, 
I love this work, but I wanted to bring my contribution back to Massachusetts and Amherst, and I arrived in 2018 ready to answer the call for public service. And my deepest know-how and experience is in education, hence I've uh, responded to this request for volunteers. Uh, not only have I served on educational boards, I am a teacher. I was teaching critical thinking to Boston Public School students in 1999. I currently teach business ethics. Specifically, I help students uh, formulate arguments to tap into their own sense of values and make the case for how businesses should be responsible in dealing with society. Uh, I'm also an attorney. I've negotiated contracts, large and small. I briefed cases as a litigator. And finally, as a, on a personal note, let me tell you that I moved from Puerto Rico to Framingham, Massachusetts in the first grade. I attended the public schools there. And in the middle school, I actually uh, had one of these open classroom schools like Wildwood and Fort River. Thank you. Thank you. Ryan? Hi, good evening. First, I just want to take a quick moment uh, to thank the school committee and the town council for taking the time to speak with me and each of the other candidates tonight. Uh, I wanted to quickly thank uh, Ms. Lord and Ms. Lozdowski, as well as uh, Mr. De Los Reyes uh, for their willingness to step forward uh, for what is a significant uh, time contribution. Uh, as a bit of uh, background, my name is Ryan Driscoll. I was born and raised in Western Massachusetts. In Massachusetts. <clears throat> I was fortunate to have been educated through the Northampton public school system. College brought me to Boston where I lived for over a decade. It's there that I met my wife, Charlotte, and we had our first child, Leo. As new parents, we needed to decide the best place where we would establish our roots and raise our family. That is what brought my family to Amherst. That's what brought me before you today. As a father <clears throat> and a member of the Amherst community, I'm completely floored and honestly embarrassed at the state and facilities of Wildwood <clears throat> and Fort River. It's heartbreaking to me to hear children opting to keep their coats on during the school day in an effort to stay warm in the face of an inadequate heating system. It's heartbreaking to hear concerns of teachers that damp conditions and deteriorating infrastructure may have a negative impact on their health. Perhaps the greatest tragedy all, of all <clears throat> is that this complete failure to provide adequate space for learning has disproportionately impacted our students who are most at risk. As a candidate, I do not claim to have all the answers. I don't have a PhD. What I do have is a self-awareness to know what I don't know, and the humility to seek out insight from those best suited to contribute to an equitable solution. <laughs> the complex issues facing the school committee need to be addressed from multiple perspectives uh, that are represent representative of a uh, diverse group of stakeholders. <clears throat> As a new member of the Amherst community, I can provide a fresh perspective <clears throat> and a renewed sense of urgency to the challenges ahead. I'm committed to doing this while remaining cognizant and respectful of where I come into this process and how I fit into the larger picture here. There's been a lot of positive progress in the last few years. I believe that the school committee is on the right path. I support Superintendent Mr. Morris and have given the opportunity I intend to ensure that this momentum continues to move forward in the right direction. Thank you. Katie. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I feel privileged to be here among all of you tonight, especially given the current global pandemic. In that spirit, I can't begin without acknowledging so many people who are suffering both directly and indirectly the effects of COVID-19. Tonight, my objective is to demonstrate that my skills, my knowledge, and my experience situate me as the best candidate to fill the vacancy on the Amherst School Committee. My presence here illustrates the strong desire I have maintained since campaigning for the seat on the Amherst School Committee this past fall. During my campaign, I reached out to the current school committee members, and together we worked to ensure that the League of Women Voters Forum offered Spanish interpretation services, reflecting all of our commitment to access. Since then, I have watched you work together in a spirit of collegiality, and I would be honored to join the four of you and uphold that same spirit. Like you, I support the compromise proposal of consolidating the three elementary schools into two, and will work to ensure that decisions around the project will build our community, not divide us. In many ways, I wish more than one of us could be selected this evening, because I know the work is extensive, particularly in this cycle, with many decisions to be made about infrastructure and the budget. I know the workload and the time commitment is significant, and I'm eager, and perhaps more importantly, ready to jump right in to assist you. I have been following the school committee meetings closely since 2014, attending meetings when agenda topics are of particular interest to me, and later watching those meetings that I don't attend in person. 
As I will describe in my responses this evening, it is my passion and my commitment to the Amherst schools and our wonderful teachers and students that drive my desire to serve Amherst in this capacity. Thank you. Heather. Good evening. I present myself as a candidate to fill the Amherst School Committee seat left vacant by Eric Nakajima's departure. I would like to thank Mr. Nakajima for his years of commitment and service to the Amherst community and wish him well on his newest endeavor. I'm running for the seat because I believe the Amherst School Committee and community would benefit greatly from my lived experiences, my professional experiences, and my passion to dismantling white supremacy, classism, heteronormativity, ableism, transphobia, and working to elevate voices that tend to be silenced as mine was for many years. Bell Hook's piece called Marginality as a Site of Resistance has helped me use my voice and inspires me to pay it forward. I live and breathe anti-racism and continuously work on anti-oppression. I have been informed by my life growing up with trauma and living in poverty, a black woman of mixed race parentage, living with a disability and fluidity. Many of our students can be found at these sociocultural locations and the variety of needs they have often go unnoticed and unmet. My lived experience alone does not qualify me for this position because that does not necessarily equip one with the analysis and the tools to educate others and dismantle systems of oppression. It is the years with Undoing Racism, an organizing collective, and the Anti-Racism Consulting Committee that have prepared me for this position. It is the 20 years in the Amherst schools in different roles working with our students, our families, and our teachers and staff that has prepared me for this position. It is the commitment to inclusivity and listening to the voices of our families and students that has made it imperative for me to apply for this position. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you. So the next, the beginning of the questions to which you each have one to maximum two minutes as the first one is based upon your opening statement and the description of the responsibilities of ex and expectations of school committee members is there anything else you would like to add that additionally describes your ability to fulfill these responsibilities and expectations? This time we begin with Ryan. Thank you. Uh, I spent the better part of uh, the last decade working as an administrator at Harvard University. Uh, here I was responsible for the uh, uh, for government reporting uh, responsibilities as well as the uh, facilitating a payment of annuities uh, required to uh, sustain their intellectual patent portfolio. Uh, my employment at Harvard allowed me to pursue uh, graduate, um, graduate studies in civil rights, community engagement, and nonprofit management as a means of a professional enrichment. Uh, without this opportunity, I wouldn't have been able to afford to do this otherwise. Uh, I'm currently employed by the University of Massachusetts Amherst, where I regularly review accepted uh, research proposals from the NSF and the associated budget um, with each proposal uh, and each, each project. Um, I have experience reviewing and managing uh, the post award process in accordance with university policy guidelines and uh, uh, federal regulations, which I think would be analogous to the role of this position. Thank you. Uh, Katie, you're next. Thank you. The primary duties of the school committee include the hiring and evaluation of the superintendent and the review and approval of the district's budgets. I briefly spoke to my ability to fulfill these responsibilities in my statement of interest. In my 20 years work of experience in the education sector, I have evaluated in-service and pre-service teachers again and again. Both locally and internationally, I have mentored and supported teachers to help them achieve their professional goals. In our own district, through my work as a school equity task force member since 2014, I have advised the school committee on ways to include equity-oriented goals of this, for the superintendent. Equally important is my experience in, in the nonprofit sector, which well situates me to guide the district budget process each year. In my professional work, I regularly write grant proposals for considerable sums of money and develop budgets in collaboration with my colleagues. The need to analyze budgets, practice fiscal responsibility, and think beyond a one-year timeframe are necessary skills for the selected candidate. I ask that you select someone this evening who is adequately prepared to responsibly oversee over half of the town's budget. 
I have volunteered in various capacities in Amherst since moving here in 2010. I have met people through my roles and as an LSSC basketball coach, a religious educator, a neighborhood food project coordinator at the Amherst Survival Center, by attending regular potlucks for Lucio Perez, and helping with PGO events at Fort River. Furthermore, I'm connected to people through my profession and as a graduate of UMass, and through being the mother of an elementary school student. My circles are vast and varied, which connects me to, with constituents from a variety of settings, and I see myself as a build, a build bridger and someone who collaborates well with people with diverse opinions. These connections will help me facilitate the communication between the public and the district. Thank you. Uh, Heather, you are next. Thank you. My opening statement speaks to interpersonal and intrapersonal strength in the multiple intelligence framework. I have other skills that I'd like to let you know about right now. I served in management positions in restaurants and in theaters. I have managed the budget at Smith, New World Theater, and as a restaurant manager. I was a coordinator for New World Theater's Project 2050, which worked with youth, scholars, and artists at Amherst College to learn about, inform about, and perform about systems of oppression and look at a time where there'll be no clear majority in this country. I have a master's in education through UMass, um, where I focus on multicultural curriculum. So I understand curriculum, scaffolding, backward design, and have learned how to use my discourse analysis training to deconstruct biases. I recently finished a rigorous master's program at Smith while a single mother who was working, so I have energy and perseverance. My second master's is in social work, and that has helped me to navigate conflict and better see other people's positions when they are in opposition to mine. So in social justice circles, we have differing views on how to accomplish equity. Some believe we need to burn it all down and begin again as the system is embedded in patriarchy and white supremacy. Others believe we need to find ways to work within the system and affect change that way. Holding both opinions is important to me and finding ways to work together towards our goal is one thing that I hope to accomplish while on school committee. Thank you. Thank you. Gaston. Thank you. So, you know, it's, it's humbling to be a fellow candidate with um, Heather, Ryan, and Katie. And I think that the difficult decision tonight is the, the council and the school committees, clearly. So I see my role as just trying to help you make the right decision for the school committee, the children in the town. Um, I am a relative newcomer. Um, I moved here first in 2004, but just back now in 2018, which is really the year that Amherst was reborn. And so that gives me a fresh perspective. So I can hit the ground running as far as the work of governance. I have the experience to do that. But in many respects, I have fresh eyes to what's going on in the schools and the challenges. So I am innocent of the struggles that uh, preceded uh, the Newtown Charter. And I think that that may be a disadvantage, an advantage, excuse me. Um, I'll just also put in perspective that um, when Anastasia Ordonez became uh, a member of the school committee, she was also relatively new uh, to the town. So that is uh, a precedent in, uh, in the school committee. Um, finally, just to kind of add a little bit more about myself, I have been concerned with uh, many of the issues that Heather is speaking about for a long time. And um, I studied philosophy, but I also studied courses at the education school anti-racist multicultural education, education for political and social change. And uh, I look forward to uh, continuing that work. However, I have the opportunity to do so. I have the um, experience of a mother who was an educator and have learned alongside her career uh, about the challenges of running a school system. So uh, thank you so much. Okay, uh, we're going to move on to the next question. Similarly, based upon your opening statement, is there anything else you would like to add to the reasons you are interested in serving on the Amherst and Amherst Pelham Regional School Committees? And why should we select you? And we begin this time with Katie. I'm interested in serving because I feel I have the skill set that can be put to good use to advance the mission of the Amherst Public Schools to support the wonderful teachers and our diverse student body. I want to invest my time and experience to help tackle the financial challenges to come with the dual lenses of an educator who understands what resources are necessary and an administrator who understands that difficult choices will need to be made. I believe you should select me because my experience in education complements the experience of the current school committee members. They have proven themselves to think critically about the topic at hand 
often through their own professional lenses. As an educator with expertise in teaching and learning, I offer a vantage point in terms of how policies and decisions will impact the students that we are here to serve. For example, my PhD program focused on language policy and practice, and my knowledge of bilingual education models can help to ensure the success of our dual language program. I believe strongly in the Caminantes program for numerous reasons. It's a direct reflection of our district's mission, and it attempts to address the enrollment challenges we experience, possibly helping to retain families that might otherwise choose a local charter school with an immersion program. It benefits all of our students who are enrolled. Studies show that multilinguals are better problem solvers, more creative, and better planners, skills that will assist students throughout their education and beyond. Also, I'm aware that a significant percentage of students receive special education services, and as a parent and foster parent, my children have directly benefited from these services. Many parents are drawn to our district because of the quality of Amherst Special Education Services, and I believe these programs need to be supported. As an educator, I know that some of these services, while unique to a single student by way of an IEP or 504 plan, often leads to more effective instruction and thus better learning outcomes for all students. Thank you. Heather. I'm grateful to Katie's commitment to having a translator, and it is of utmost importance. We have a bilingual and on the way to being bicultural elementary program. We need accessibility for our families. I'm not yet proficient as a Spanish speaker, but I'm committed to getting fluent as soon as possible. Well on my way. It is a necessity, and I've been learning with the goal of being bilingual as soon as possible. This speaks to my capacity and openness to learning. As a physically abled bodied person, I used to take that privilege for granted and didn't have to think about the accessibility in buildings. I learned to look at buildings that I go to now and think about it from another perspective. Would I feel welcome? Would I feel I don't belong? It's an important value to me, learning what I don't know and increasing my capacity to use the locations where I'm privileged as an activist for those who don't hold that privilege. My ability and openness to learn is a value I feel is important to the school committee. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and Gaston? Thank you. I, I guess I'd like to speak to what you would get if you have me um, as a member of your committee. And uh, I'm, first of all, a very critical thinker. I challenge assumptions. I try to make sure that the group knows why we're asking the questions that we're asking. I try to clarify the issues. I uh, like to put in the time outside of the actual meetings to develop ideas and um, draw up uh, whether it's agreements to uh, have a potential alliance with a private or public sector institution, uh, whether it's to explore an idea that has not been uh, yet developed so it can be discussed at the next meeting. I like to collaborate and highlight uh, what it is that the group has to decide about so that if there is disagreement, the group knows what we're disagreeing about and what positions we have to take in order to uh, reach a reasonable disagreement uh, that reveals that we all still uh, care about the same things, but take different positions about how to get there. Ryan. <clears throat> we have a responsibility to provide our children with a competitive education and exposure to a diversity of ideas. I would be personally, <clears throat> personally, I'd be disappointed in myself if I remained on the sidelines during this transition. As I said before, I put my name forward to help ensure that the school committee continues to make what I believe is positive progress. I will do anything I can do, uh, to ensure that the handoff and leadership is clean, and that we continue to move forward as a district and as a community. I pride myself as being someone who is pragmatic, process-oriented, and a team player. <clears throat> There's no room in the process for ego. The best solution should be pursued regardless of where it originated. Uh, I believe this puts this, this uh, frame of mind puts me in a position where I could do a, a good job facilitating conversations among the school committee's numerous and diverse group of stakeholders. Uh, this is especially true of groups uh, who are typically underrepresented in the process. Uh, we can't rely solely on people's ability to come to us. We need to bring the discussion to them on their terms to ensure that the process is equitable and that feedback, uh, the feedback that we have is comprehensive. Uh, as of last week, nearly 100 students uh, in the Amherst Public School System uh, were trying to adapt to learning remotely without access to Wi-Fi. Uh, Mr. Harrington uh, has rightfully said in the past that some could argue that there is more than one Amherst. This is something that needs to be kept at the forefront of every decision. 
uh, and we need to ensure that the process is equitable for all stakeholders and that is something I'm committed to. Thank you. We're gonna move on to the next set of questions. So just take a breath, you know, pause. <laughs> um, this is regarding your experience with the Amherst Public Schools. And the first question, which we will start with Heather, is what is your past or present experience or connection with the Amherst Elementary or Amherst Pelham Regional Public Schools? Heather? Thank you. Truth be told, there isn't enough time in this minute or two to cover it all as the journey that spanned 43 years of my life when I started kindergarten at Fort River in 1976. My early life would have me move around Amherst Pelham and experience the different elementary schools and then move away before touching back for eighth grade for a few months and then landing back permanently as a junior in the high school. Altogether, I attended 17 schools across four states from kindergarten to graduation, which at the time increased my appreciation for Amherst and helped build my perspective. I've worn many hats with the Amherst School, from student to parent, advocate, tutor, substitute, music director, part of the PGO, resident director to the eight high school scholars at the ABC House, student teacher, student adjustment counselor intern, and presently serving on a couple of committees connected to UROC on doing racism organized committee where a group of teachers, administrators, and staff come together and we actively work on dismantling the institutional racism in our schools. Thank you. Thank you. Gaston? Thank you. So I have uh, two children in the schools, a uh, fifth grader at Wildwood and an eighth grader at the middle school rising to the high school. Um, my wife and I moved back to Amherst for our kids to attend the schools. In my first fall here, I supported the PGO, bringing my experience from a PGO with a, a, a kind of a huge budget in comparison and shared some uh, best practices. Earlier this year, I joined the newly reforming uh, school council at the middle school and um, have uh, tried to help get that institution uh, formalized, supporting with the little bit that I can do taking minutes. And um, that is the that is the extent of my experience with the Amherst Public Schools. Thank you. Um, Ryan. <clears throat> yeah, admittedly, uh, I did not attend Amherst Public Schools. Uh, I did have the fortunate opportunity to be educated by the Northampton Public School System. Uh, and I believe both uh, districts are uh, committed to ac the academic achievement of every student and uh, social justice and multiculturalism. Uh, in preparation for our conversation today, I contacted almost everyone in the staff directory on the ARPS, a, APRS website uh, to, list, to solicit their feedback and their experiences. Uh, those who chose to share their experience demonstrated a clear passion and a dedicated interest uh, in seeing what's best for our students. Uh, this is perhaps best conveyed by a teacher at the middle school who said, uh, quote, nothing warms my heart more than to hear my name called in a store restaurant or on the street and embrace the adult that they had become, they being their former student. Uh, I was encouraged that the majority of respondents reported that they feel they are provided with adequate resources to do their job effectively. Uh, I have friends who are teachers in neighboring districts and I know for a fact that they um, are put in positions where they subsidize their classroom budgets with their own salary. And Katie. My first exposure to the schools was as a substitute teacher when my partner and I moved to town 10 years ago. We had just re um, returned from the Peace Corps in West Africa and we rented on Chestnut Street and I was just beginning my PhD at UMass. And to supplement my graduate stipend, I um, decided to substitute teach. I substitute taught at Wildwood, the middle school and the high school. After the birth of our son and having fallen in love with Western Massachusetts, we wanted to settle here. But before purchasing a house, I did some tours of elementary schools in neighboring towns. Our decision to purchase a home in Amherst was driven by the racial and ethnic diversity of the student body that was apparent in the Amherst classrooms. And that the district's mission statement also upholds the academic achievement of every student and a commitment to social justice. 
My son began his three-year tenure at Crocker Farm Preschool in 2014 before moving to Fort River, where he is a current second grader. Additionally, throughout the past six years, our foster children have attended Fort River as well as the Head Start program. I'm also connected to the district through my volunteer work. Since its inception in 2014, I've been an active member of the School Equity Task Force, attending monthly meetings over the past six years. Some of the accomplishments during that time include the establishment of the restorative justice program at the middle school and high school, and the development of a policy that was passed by the regional school committee in 2015, titled Climate Data Collection and Analysis. The policy aims to prioritize the use of particip participatory methods to explore issues related to the ARP school environment and community, including issues of racial, multicultural, and social justice climate as experienced by teachers, students, and parents. I sustain my commitment to SETF because it serves to uphold the district's mission statement, the same mission that drew us to this district to begin with. Thank you. We're going on to the next question, Liz. What do you think is one strength and one area for improvement in Amherst Elementary and the regional schools? We start with Gaston. So I, I would say that the strength I'd like to highlight is the sense of decency in, in the system uh, reflected in the incorporation of restorative justice at the high school, the attitude towards immigration, you feel it in the offices of the schools, the enthusiasm for the Caminantes program, the uh, effort to promote the seal of biliteracy. There's a sense that even if there are disagreements about the, the strategy, that you're gonna speak to people who share your fundamental values. And those values are uh, fundamentally about uh, a sense of decency and caring. And so I would uh, suggest that that is not something that any school district can easily recreate. You either have it or you don't. And I think Amherst has it. Um, as for a weakness to highlight, I um, honestly, I am concerned that too many of the hours of my uh, children's time in school is uninspiring. Um, and I would contrast that with the very engaging time that they have in uh, many of the specials, the uh, group-based activities, project-based activities in, for example, tech and art. And I would like to see much more of the standard so-called curriculum uh, be project-based and inspiring to children um, across the board. Ryan. Right, so it goes without saying that our teachers are our biggest asset. And another thing that uh, my answer to follow that's predicated on uh, is that we need to uh, address the achievement gaps in terms of a systemic weakness. Uh, I know that we've made progress on that and I appreciate uh, Amherst's commitment to doing so. Uh, in terms of our elementary school, uh, I support the dual language program. Uh, my wife is bilingual. We encourage, uh, when, when we're reading our child books uh, at night, we do it in two languages. Um, weaknesses of the uh, Amherst uh, Elementary Schools, clearly Fort River and Wildwood, uh, the conditions are unacceptable and frankly uh, infuriating, <laughs> infuriating. <clears throat> but I know uh, we all here already know that, so I don't want to kind of continue to hammer that home, but it just still kind of it blows my mind that it's gotten to this point. Um, uh, in terms of uh, a, uh, PRS strength, the uh, high school, in terms of key performance metrics, uh, outperforms the state and uh, a lot of them, uh, student performance on standardized testing, graduation rates, uh, graduates who pursue post-secondary education. Uh, in terms of weaknesses, um, based on the conversations I had, I'm honestly concerned about the middle school. Uh, there's been a lot of uh, overturn, um, um, turnover in leadership, and I think it's taken a toll on the organizational culture. This could be completely anecdotal to the conversations I had, um, but it's something that I would want to explore to the extent that it's appropriate um, as a school member, a school committee member. Sorry, sorry, I had to mute myself because our phone rang. Katie, please go ahead. Thank you. At the elementary level, I believe one of our many strengths is the retention of our teachers. Consistently over the past decade, we retain close to 88% of our teaching staff. 
This helps to create and sustain the strong school culture and community that we have in our schools. One area that I know is being addressed by the district, which needs to be um, continued, which needs to be a continued area of focus is the hiring and retentions of teachers who better reflect the diversity of our student body. Diversity takes on many forms, but in particular, I think of racial and ethnic diversity. Studies show that students of color are more successful in their education when they're taught by people who look like them. Over half of our elementary students identify as students of color, yet only 25% of elementary full-time employees are people of color, and this includes all staff, not just teachers. As with the elementary schools, at the regional level, our diversity of our student body is an asset for all learners. Over 20% of the district students are students with disabilities, more than a quarter are economically disadvantaged, and 45% identify as students of color. This diversity is a strength and undoubtedly draws families to our town, including new university and college faculty, staff, and students. However, the DESE report card for our regional district shows there are disparities in terms of how our students are experiencing their education. One example that illustrates this is the disparities among the high school dropout rates. Among our population that identifies as Hispanic, for example, this rate is close to 5% in the past few years compared to the rate of the entire population, which is closer to 1.4%. It is um, about 10% for high school English language learners. In terms of discipline, students of color are twice as likely to receive disciplinary action than their white peers. In recent year, the years, the district has made a more concerted effort to address discipline disparities, to close the opportunity gap, and to hire and retain teachers who resemble the demographics of the student body. But there's still work that needs to be done. Thank you. Heather. Thank you. One strength in the school system is the people. I know that's broad and vague, but I have seen the impact of the people who care for our students. The bus drivers, the administrators, lunch servers, teachers, custodians, and the paras taking the time to learn the name of a sibling, to hear a joke, or to ask, no, how are you really doing? I've seen them come together to spend hours to fundraise to make sure distance learning can be more equitable. I've seen some of them at Black Lives Matter rallies and restorative justice workshops. I've seen them standing in the rain recently to hand out meals during this time of crisis to make sure that children have access to food. And I've seen them get creative to find ways to let the students know they are loved and missed. One area that I feel is imperative of improvement that I feel is imperative is to stop the ways in which we continue institutional and structural racism. Without exaggeration, I experience it, see it, and hear about it on a daily basis, sometimes multiple times a day. I understand that most of the time it is a well-intended person who doesn't realize that which they do. From the preschool board book where you eat your colors, the yummy red strawberry and the yummy blue blueberry. And then for black, they had a burnt bagel. To the first grade teacher who was connecting with a black student during free time, but proceeded to use the building materials to construct handcuffs and handcuff him. Up to the high school, to the student who discusses, can we use the N-word or says mulatto? Or in a class where the black student didn't have a pencil, he got scolded. A minute later, a white student asked for a pencil and was handed one without the scolding. We got a lot of work to do. And the strength that I mentioned, the people, is what is needed to get to a place where we can decolonize our implicit and explicit curriculum. And we can be more aware of our implicit biases, our privileges, and sharpen our anti-oppression lenses to catch things more quickly. Thank you. Um, we're going to switch to Allison asking the questions. And she will begin with the next one with Ryan. Thank you, Lynn. Um, so the public often has a limited understanding of the role of the school committee plays in school or district decisions such as math curriculum, the hiring of principals, or in addressing parent complaints about an individual teacher. What is your understanding of the role you as a school committee member should play in these types of decisions? And as Lynn mentioned, we're going to begin with Ryan. Uh, thank you, Ms. McDonald. Um, so the school committee's policies are meant to be uh, a broad statement of direction. Uh, if we were running uh, a corporation, the school committee would be the board of directors. Uh, under this analogy, uh, Mr. Morrison, the superintendent, he would be the CEO. Uh, uh, 
the uh, he, he I'm sorry uh, as a CEO he would be responsible for or, or is responsible for the administration and the implementation of the school committee's policies and it's on uh, the school committee not to micromanage um, uh, I would see someone as my role uh, as a school committee member I would really embrace the uh, community outreach portion of it um, that's all I have Thank you. Um, and move on to Katie next. First and foremost, I understand the role of the school committee member is to evaluate the superintendent and oversee the budget. In addition, school committee members act as liaisons between the public and the district. School committee members should actively seek feedback from their constituents and share it with the district in order to address it. Additionally, the school committee should ensure that information is being disseminated broadly to the public. I see it as the school committee's responsibility to ensure that decision-making processes take into consideration constituents' feedback and other information, be it information from working groups, current research, consultancies reports. The role of the school committee will vary depending on the situation. With respect to the math curriculum, it is the role of the school committee to hear from teachers and administration on the problems they are trying to address and to seek input from parents and students where appropriate. The committee should be presented with the proposed solutions and discuss the advantages and disadvantages advantages to each and make a decision on whether to move forward with a curriculum change as recommended by staff and administration. The school committee should request updates on a regular basis on the implementation of the new curriculum to monitor its progress and change course as necessary. The hiring process of building principals is a process led by the superintendent and the human resources director with guidance from the school committee. I know this process has recently been adjusted to ensure more equitable practices and representation from various stakeholders. Finally, in terms of parent complaints of a particular teacher, these should first be directed to the building principal or to human resources. And now Heather. Thank you. First, I'd love to increase the public's understanding of the school committee and how the school committee is used to benefit the school system. As I understand it, the issues mentioned do not specifically fall into the purview of the school committee. Decisions that include math curriculum and hiring of principals is addressed by the superintendent, and addressing a parent's complaints about an individual teacher would be addressed by a principal or the superintendent's office. Having said that, in the dual role of accountability that is in the next question, um, the school committee could be available to the superintendent to support and set goals should they determine they would benefit from it. Thank you. Thank you. And now, um, Gaston. Thank you. So uh, I had the experience being on a board that was responsible for the uh, hiring and oversight of the executive director. I went through this learning curve and it, it took me a, a little bit of time, to be honest, to understand what it is not to try to micromanage and um, get into the operations of the school, in this case, the school system, but rather to uh, create the conditions for the success of the superintendent and to uh, run interference with the state and the federal governments, to make connections to parts of the town government that can collaborate and support the schools, um, to strategize on stakeholder management, by which I mean uh, reaching out and connecting to parents and local business, but to support fundamentally the um, success of the superintendent and the uh, institutions that it is the superintendent's responsibility to manage. Thank you. Moving on to our next question, and this one will start with Katie. The committee is expected to collaborate with and hold the superintendent accountable at the same time. How would you approach this dual role to achieve the best outcomes for students? Katie. I appreciate the fact that the students are at the heart of this question. In school governance, it's easy to get caught up in the many issues and tasks on the table and lose track of why we're at the table in the first place. Students should inform the work, everything from creating the agenda to decision-making processes, and especially in terms of criteria that are set for the superintendent evaluation process. My career has allowed me extensive opportunities to work directly with and to evaluate others. My approach to collaborate while holding the superintendent accountable will reflect the balance that I've mastered in terms of supporting and evaluating, which entails building trust and building a mutually respectful relationship. 
If elected, I see it as my responsibility as a school committee member to collaborate with and support the superintendent while also be willing to ask tough questions when appropriate. I imagine it is similar to how the town councilors work with the town manager. I would strive for the committee to set clear and measurable goals for the superintendent as early in the school year as possible. This provides clarity and guidance for the superintendent as to where he should prioritize his time and effort. There will never be enough time to tackle everything, so the committee needs to collaborate with the superintendent to determine the district's priorities as he is the primary conduit to building principals, teachers, and ultimately students. Goals should be student-centric where possible, and the committee needs to ensure that throughout the year, there are ample opportunities for the superintendent to check in on the progress towards the individual goals and adjust as necessary. If we are all effective in our roles, he will successfully meet the objectives and the district, both the students and staff, will benefit. Thank you. Next up, Heather. Thank you. The dual role is one I hope to have with all of my relationships. We collaborate and we hold each other accountable. To me, it's part and parcel of reciprocity. I understand this is an institutionalized version of that, but what I'd like to do is also recognize much of what we hold as institutional follows white supremacist culture. I understand that there needs to be the institutional side of accountability with evaluation and reportable data that is accessible to others. Can we find ways to deconstruct some of that while still being accountable to DESE? Maybe not. And there are other issues that need to be prioritized, but maybe we can approach it in ways that are a little bit different. What is important for me to hold on to when bringing accountability forward is to be clear, fair, and kind in the delivery. If the environment is contentious, we won't be able to put our best selves forward and serve our students. Difficult conversations and conflicts will come up, and if we have a framework for them, we can navigate it with less tension. Thank you. Thank you. And next, Gaston. Thank you. So I don't see these two roles as uh, really distinct. Um, in formal terms, the relationship of the superintendent with the school committee is arm's length. It's mediated through a contract. Uh, I don't consider that the role of a member of the school committee is to be loyal to the superintendent. My obligation, if I am on the school committee, is to respect and inspire the superintendent to be an ally and a facilitator to ask, how can we help you? What do you need? Uh, because uh, my accountability, the school committee's accountability, is for the success of the superintendent. So I think the school committee exists to serve and create the conditions for the success of the superintendent to perform the legwork that contributes and makes it possible for the superintendent to succeed. Thank you. And Brian. Uh, so I would approach this uh, in terms of just always remaining focused on what we're there to accomplish as the committee uh, in collaboration with the superintendent. And uh, like we said, what's in the best interest of our students uh, should be at the center of all decisions. Uh, going into the process, I know that there may be inherent difficulties given the dual role, um, but ultimately we're all there for the same, uh, to accomplish the same thing. <clears throat> I would be cognizant of which role I needed to be in at any given time. I suspect there's maybe some difficulty in the fluidity um, that goes along with um, balancing the two. Um, I haven't had the opportunity to meet Mr. Morris in person, uh, but I've been very impressed with his work. Uh, he seems like a smart guy and he's incredibly well-spoken and uh, I have a lot of respect for him. And I think honestly Amherst is uh, fortunate to have him. Thank you. Moving on to our next question, and this one we'll start with Heather. How do you deal with differing views when engaging in a committee decision-making process? Again, we'll start with Heather. At the heart of it, I believe we have the same desire to serve our students. I hold that truth to be self-evident and then understand that we are all different. We have different ideas of what that truth looks like. Hearing the differing views with an open heart and mind is necessary, and then being inclusive of the fact that our sociocultural locations will inform us in a variety of ways to how to get there. Granted, there's the external pressures that come with being a public school, 
um, system and needing to be accredited by the state where there are consequences for not checking the necessary boxes. So it's a balance. Working to find a compromise within the constraints we have before us is the goal. I will use my training in restorative justice and social work to support hearing each other's differing views, figuring ways to build bridges and cultivate common grounds because we are better together. Thank you. Next, we have Gaston. Thank you. So I would start by saying that I would be um, much more uncomfortable if there weren't differing views uh, on a committee. And I would then see my, my first role to try to um, make sure that we have covered all the perspectives that we need and try to find the disagreements before we reach a consensus. So once we uh, get the conversation going, my first question is always, have we done our homework? Have we uh, turned the stones over that we need to turn over before we can make a good, de good decision here? What principles are at stake? What are we really making a judgment on? And what are we staking our personal uh, conviction on when we uh, execute this decision? What judgments are we making? Um, the other question is, how important is it to have consensus on this question? The more important consensus is on a given question, the, the, the longer and the, the harder that it makes sense to struggle and see if we can find how to uh, construct the choice so that the group can come together. Thank you. And next, uh, Ryan. Yeah, I think that's really well said. Uh, if there isn't dissenting opinion, you probably don't have everyone at the table that you need to make an informed decision. Uh, a, a healthy debate is part of the process as long as it remains respectful. Uh, I believe it's through well-informed uh, dissenting opinions uh, that the best ideas emerge. Uh, as a general rule, I make sure that I don't take things personally. Um, I would always remain focused on the big picture uh, and what we're there to accomplish as a committee uh, and just have a self-awareness to know it's not about me, it's not about any one individual. If that were the case, there wouldn't be a committee. Um, and that always just, I would just try to remain sensitive to uh, the under, to, to understanding where the other person is coming from and know that uh, my life experiences are not uh, or, or may not be representative of theirs. Thank you. And next, Katie. Thank you. I can't help to wonder how everyone's doing right now. Um, my career offers me ample opportunities to work with a diverse set of people who come from different backgrounds and hold different perspectives. During my time as a Peace Corps volunteer 10 years ago, I often had to step outside of my comfort zone in hearing people's beliefs about controversial topics, be it gender roles or perspectives about the United States. I have found that asking questions to better learn and understand people's perspective is often the first step in bringing up issues that have not been considered. I believe that discussing varying viewpoints can strengthen and further justify a particular decision. When things become tense, I often fall into the role of a facilitator and work to ensure that various viewpoints are considered. I am very much a process-oriented person and want to ensure the process of arriving at a decision is a positive experience for everyone involved. I believe that valuing and respecting different views can lead to a deeper understanding and a more vetted and acceptable outcome. Thank you. For our next question, we're going to start with Gaston. This question is, is there anything in your work, travel, or other plans that will keep you away from Amherst so that you're not able to attend meetings in person regularly and fulfill other duties of the committee. Again, we'll start with Gaston. Sure, thank you. So um, I'm uh, lucky to be teaching 100% online uh, for uh, George Washington, even before the coronavirus uh, pandemic. And so um, gratefully, the answer is uh, no. And even when I am teaching, I uh, can schedule to not have to uh, be away Tuesdays, Mondays, uh, I've been an active member of the Board of License Commissioners and uh, have not missed a meeting. Um, so the answer is I am prepared to uh, be in person and make the commitment to the committee. Okay. Thank you. Next up, Ryan. Uh, yep, I'm available and fully committed. Uh, 
submitting a statement of interest is not something that I took lightly. It was a decision that I gave a lot of thought to. I had a conversation about my wife about it because uh, it is a time commitment and some of the responsibilities uh, as a parent and uh, around the house will inevitably fall to her if this is uh, something I'm dedicating so much time to. Uh, but no, I'll be around and I don't foresee uh, anything that would prevent that. And honestly, hopefully we are meeting in person <laughs> at some point in the near future. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, uh, Katie. Thank you. I thought a lot about this um, when I ran in the fall in terms of how do we draw in people to run for office? And I think a lot of what we need to think about is how do we make it accessible for those who are serving and building democracy? Um, as a mother, I have various challenges, um, and at the same time, I think being a mother of a young child often gives me a, a critical vantage point to really think about what our students are experiencing. Um, I had the luxury of working locally and have flexibility in terms of my schedule. There are times when I do travel internationally, um, but provided technology is allowed to tune into meetings such as this one um, there are certainly ways to to work around that thank you and next heather when i opened i talked about having been in 17 schools and um as great as that was i was committed to not putting my children through that so i'm committed to staying in amherst for a while um even post graduation because she wants to come back so i do not foresee any conflict of me being able to serve. Thank you. Thank you. And now for the next questions, we'll turn it back over to Lynn. Ooh, remember to unmute. So take a breath while I get organized for our next round. Um, next set of questions are about the Mass School Building Authority and the new building. The school building project that was accepted by the MSBA in December is one building for K through five or six that would replace Fort River and Wildwood schools with the location of the project as yet to be determined. As a member of the school committee, what will you contribute to the work of this project? And we begin with Ryan. Thank you. Uh, again, uh, as I said before, I want to be respectful as to where I am coming into this process. There's been a lot of thought and work uh, and effort already that's already gone into this. Uh, so I'm not coming to the table with a checklist of things that I want to personally see done. Um, uh, in terms of where I would start from day one, if given the opportunity um, to work on this project, I would, I would have a conversation with the school committee members, as well as other people um, who have been involved uh, to see what their priorities are. Um, and I'd be helpful or happy to help out in any way um, that I can. Um, generally, uh, I would approach this role uh, as someone who would be uh, in the forefront of the community outreach required for this project and the decisions involved. <clears throat> As you said, the, loca the location still has to be determined. There's a lot of um, difficult, looming questions that are still out there. Um, and community engagement is going to be a central part of making sure that those answers um, are adequate. Katie. As I stated during my campaign this past fall, I'm committed to ensuring the success of the compromise framework proposed by the superintendent. I would imagine that Mr. Bockelman will soon put out a call for volunteers to serve on the school, school building committee. This committee will work within the MSBA framework to address the many aspects of the school building project, such as the site, construction approach, and design options. If elected, I would be willing to serve on the school building committee if the current four school committee members so choose. Concurrently, the school committee will be charged with developing the educational plan building on the superintendent's model of a single K through five or K through six school of 600 students or less to replace the Fort River, to replace Fort River and Wildswood. I can contribute my research ability to work through developing an education plan that can garner support from teachers, parents, and the community at large. 
It is my goal to keep the public informed every step of the way and to work to create opportunities for the public to participate throughout this process. Heather. One way I would love to contribute to this project is to work with the community, holding time and space to hear concerns, fears, and challenges that come up with the idea of having a larger elementary school than this town is used to. The town was split around this issue and I saw it become a polarizing thing a few years ago. If we can come together and find areas of overlapping ideas and build upon that, I'm committed to working with the community around that. Perhaps even helping people understand how unhealthy those two elementary schools are presently. There may need to, need to be some healing around previous events before we can have the other conversations. And I'd be happy to facilitate some of the sort of justice activities around that. The others will be to serve on other committees like finding the location, looking at the budget, maybe even having an equity consultant committee or any committee that needs a volunteer. Thank you. Gaston. Thank you. So the, the short answer is that I would contribute whatever the school committee uh, asked me to that I'm uh, in a position to, to help with. I want to recognize that Dr. Morris in his presentation recognized that consensus may not be achievable. And so in that regard, I would like to support creating a framework for respectful disagreement and a sense that even if uh, different members of the community don't get their exact wish, that it's something that everybody owns and feels uh, good about. Specifically, um, I would like to make sure that this major investment that is going to serve the town for decades is as good as possible. And that means uh, trying to ensure that we get the experts that can contribute and ask the right questions about how we're pursuing this project. Architecture tells stories, architecture shapes learning, it has psychological impacts, and um, Amherst has the opportunity to kind of set the state of the art and have a facility that uh, leads the way for, uh, for some time. And uh, I would like to bring my experience structuring complicated corporate deals and do whatever it takes to make this project a success. Thank you. The next question is, what challenges do you foresee in moving the school project forward? And what are your ideas to meet those challenges? And we begin with Katie. In moving the school project forward, many important decisions will need to be made, including whether sixth grader, where sixth graders will be educated, whether Crocker Farm will be expanded, how to redistrict the two new enrollment zones, and whether there might be preschool at the new building, among others. Given people, giving people information will be vitally important and letting them share their thoughts and including them in the decision-making process will help move the town forward. This is a large challenge, but I know I, we can get there and I will do everything in my power to facilitate a healthy process that will unite our community. I will work to ensure that decisions around the project will build our community, not divide us. I think a critical element falls on the school committee to ensure that information is being disseminated in its entirety in an accessible and timely fashion. While some residents may pour over lengthy reports, I suspect that the majority of our residents need brief, informative, and easy to access information. We saw the success of Dr. Morris's consensus plea last year, a short video that summarized the elementary school building proposal and the MSBA's need for town consensus. The video was hosted on Amherst Media, disseminated by way of Ms. Dr. Morris's weekly newsletter and shared again and again on Facebook and other social media. I would advocate that Dr. Morris provides regular, regular updates to, provide, to keep people informed about the progress and topics at hand. I believe we need to start by identifying the common goal that we all share, building a school that we can all be proud of. Heather. There are still people who believe that small schools or neighborhood schools is the only acceptable version of Amherst that is okay. This is where conversations are needed and a compromise could be possible. I was one personally who was against a large school because I had a fear rooted in my racial justice background that was not being acknowledged or responded to. I couldn't but vote for a school that might have ended up doing more harm to the students of color. Why am I supporting this project now? because I've found ways that that fear can be addressed. And I feel confident that provisions and accountability can be in place to assure our growing, that we're growing our equity. 
And after being in one of the elementary schools for a year, I physically understand how imperative it is that we move as fast as possible while engaging in good practices. Um, there's also going to be a budgetary challenge that will need to be addressed as some residents don't want their taxes raised. And although living in an apartment complex, I don't pay Amherst taxes directly. I know it's a burden for many homeowners. So I see this as something else that will be a challenge that we'll, we'll need to address and figure out. Thank you. And Ryan. So even though I'm new to Amherst, I'm sensitive to what a divisive issue this has been for the community. Uh, the MSBA required a demonstrated consensus on high level, high level issues. Uh, and frankly, they should have. Uh, there appears to be consensus on high level issues. Uh, but with that said, as the process uh, moves forward and we're in face with increasingly granular decisions, uh, the opportunity for divisiveness is going to emerge. Uh, it's going to be challenging to address uh, a lot of the questions that are still outstanding in terms of identifying and gardening support for a specific location, dealing with the reconfigurement of grades, uh, and that's, that, that's all before you're even getting into the design process um, and the give and take involved with a project of that scale. I understand that I skipped Gaston. Excuse me for doing that, but Gaston, please come on. Sorry. <laughs> Okay, thank you. So I, I share my fellow candidates concerns. So let me just identify two particular um, issues and opportunities. One is how do you organize a process that actually brings in the views of the community and uh, creates a sense of ownership and influence over the design and construction of this project? And the opportunity in successfully doing that is to get the focus that a new building creates to create institutions that survive. Uh, the, the, the erection of this building and that become part of the fabric of, of the school system, number one. The other concern I would uh, point out is that there's this question about, is the sixth grade going to be part of the school or not? And I just wanna highlight the importance of bringing in uh, the communities in uh, Leverett and Shrewsbury as well as Pelham to participate in that thought process because whatever is done in that respect is gonna have an impact on those uh, neighboring towns. And so to create a uh, communication process early on that uh, brings in those uh, perspectives from those school committees, I think is gonna be important for uh, the success of the, the regional system. Okay. And I'm going to now turn it back over to Allison. Thank you. Um, we're now moving on to another uh, section of questions about upcoming issues facing the school committee. And for this question, next question, we'll start with Heather. What is one important issue you believe the Amherst Elementary School Committee will need to address over the next 21 months? Heather. Thank you. The MSBA project is the issue that will take much focus over the next 21 months for the Amherst Elementary School Committee. This will take connecting with community, contractors, figuring out the budget, finding compromises that are inclusive, and I'm sure there'll be difficult conversations to have. It's imperative that our students have, as Superintendent Morris outlined in his proposal presentation, a high quality learning environment with natural light, healthy breathing, and no sounds of other classes overwhelming those of us that get distracted by it. This pandemic, COVID-19, is also going to impact the budget as well. And I anticipate that there'll be lasting impacts on the revenue and much to figure out. Thank you. Next, Gaston. Gaston, are you there? Uh, so a very serious concern that I have is with the transition plan um, and how uh, kids are gonna be taken care of while this project is being developed. And so I would wanna make sure that we're being very proactive and also learning from other uh, school projects that have um, taken place in the state. So how do we take care of kids so that their primary memory looking back on elementary school isn't the years that they were displaced? because of this project that will not necessarily uh, contribute so much to their personal education. Uh, that is, that's number one. And um, another opportunity kind of shifting from the school project is um, to create foundations for the curriculum design in the classroom to be more decoupled from um, the MCAS and trying to, to, to uh, succeed on the test. And 
thinking about the MCAS as more a reality check on the course design rather than a driver of curriculum design. Thank you. Thank you. And next, Ryan. Uh, so certainly COVID-19 response is truly the most pressing issue at this immediate point in time. There are challenges in the short term, and as has already been acknowledged, there's going to be long-term budget implications uh, that I think we're just beginning to appreciate, which are going to lead to some very difficult decisions. Um, uh, in terms of the elementary school project, uh, that's going to certainly uh, be, be pressing and challenging. I share Gaston's uh, insight into um, making sure that there's a suitable transition plan for students uh, who will have to endure the construction and the project without receiving any of the benefit directly. Um, and is always the underlying question is how do we continue to uh, work towards um, addressing the achievement gap? Thank you. And next, Katie. I think I'm in agreement here with my fellow candidates. Um, a number of weeks ago, my chosen topic would have been ensuring that the elementary school build, building project makes good progress. And while we need to maintain those efforts with the advent of COVID-19, we have immediate and pressing issues facing our district, in particular, the impact that will have, it will have on the budget and on students and families. The district has been working diligently to provide distance learning to all students, accounting for differences in access and support. And while we are in the throes of it now, I believe the aftermath will be equally challenging. When the moment does come to return to school, it will be helpful to have thought through what it will look like. Even during this process to fill the vacancy, constituents have been reaching out to me expressing their concern. I think the more we can begin to think through what the summer and fall could look like, the better off we'll be. Thank you. Moving on to the next question, um, similar to the previous one, what is one important issue you believe the Amherst Regional School Committee will need to address over the next 21 months? And for this one, we'll begin with Gaston. Thank you. Um, let me bring to attention a, an issue that I know well from my experience with the PGO in, in DC. Um, many of you know that over the last two weeks, um, PGOs have successfully raised a lot of money to address the issue of hotspots. And that's um, incredibly important to address this need. But having PGOs with substantial budgets creates important governance issues. And it also matches organizations that do not necessarily have governance structures that are up to the experience of managing significant budgets. And so there's an incredible opportunity in um, tapping into greater fundraising. Um, the PGO that I was a chair of had a budget over $250,000 that had built up over the years. So does Amherst and its uh, related towns wanna to go in that direction? If so, I think it is important to, to give leadership and create structure so that that is well managed. One of the opportunities for greater budgets from the PGOs is to address um, what I see is a, is a fundamentally problematic reality right now that children have to pay for sports, for example. So I, my view, um, children should, and families should not have to choose to figure out budgets for things like sports and after school activities, but that raises a question, where's the money come from? It could come from PGOs, but then we need leadership to address the governance issues that that would create. Thank you. Ryan? Uh, we're faced with issues regarding shrinking enrollment. Uh, I'm also very concerned about the state of the middle school. Um, I'm, I'm hesitant to uh, bring this up because I realize it may uh, not be perceived as uh, being beneficial, but um, I'm concerned that uh, teachers don't uh, feel they have adequate support when it comes to difficult uh, behavioral decisions. Um, I don't want to be labeled as the uh, disciplinarian of the candidates, um, but I feel like I would be doing a service to the um, teachers and the staff members who were willing to share their experience with me uh, and their concerns if I didn't at least address it. Thank you. Next, Katie. The budget will be a significant challenge for the Regional School Committee, especially with the financial impact of COVID-19 and when that's better known. There, are likely, there will be likely be a need to review the operating budget 
in the next few months in order to match expenses to reduce revenues. In addition, reaching agreement on the assessment method has been a perennial challenge, and I understand that discussions at four towns meetings have not been easy. Apportionating costs of a district such as ours, where one member town is so much larger than the other three, is a difficult <coughs> endeavor. Sorry for the dog. <laughs> it will be important to consider the impact on the regional budget and how costs are apportioned if a recommendation is made to move sixth graders to the middle school and only Amherst decides to move forward with that change. The Regional School Committee will need to work through this process with guidance from the superintendent and the financial director to ensure a solution is found that is palatable to each member town. Thank you. And next, Heather. My answer would have been different a month ago when there were no fatalities in Massachusetts and now we're at 957 and on our way to 26,000 fatalities nationally to COVID, and I certainly didn't understand what was to come. This pandemic has an impact on every aspect of what we do. The vendors that we have contracts with and will have contracts with, the budget, the gap in learning that is often supplemented with the summer programs that may not be possible. So supporting the Amherst Regional Public Schools to address that, the impact on the staff, the families, the students, the community. As of today, I know personally of nine Amherst families that have lost an aunt, an uncle, a brother, a sister, a father to COVID-19. And that number will increase as the days go by. The behaviors and the traumas that will be present in everyone and the looming potential of a second wave will need to be considered and addressed in some ways. As a member of the school committee, I believe we will need to find ways to support each other, mitigate the consequences, and advance the health and wellness of our school community. As the nation faces an economic crisis, if not recession, our budget is also going to feel the brunt of this pandemic. And I feel that was put off over the phone. Thank you. All right, everybody take a breath. We're on the home stretch. <laughs> we only have two more rounds to go. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit about community engagement and then we're gonna go on to your concluding remarks. The question regarding community engagement, we will start with Ryan. Um, in what ways could the school committee increase engagement and input from more residents and more diverse mix of residents with important to upcoming school committee decisions? And we begin with Ryan. Uh, so as is the case with community engagement, there's, uh, there, are, there aren't shortcuts. So a lot of this is just going to be being dedicated and uh, working hard. Uh, and when it comes to uh, work ethic, I'm absolutely relentless. Uh, I won't be out hustled. Um, leading up to today in preparation for uh, this conversation, I created a survey through Google Forms uh, and I um, <clears throat> come the uh, school's website for um, the, the staff directory and then circulated that um, message out to uh, staff members, maintenance workers, um, teachers, counselors. Um, so I think it depends on the situation as to what's the most appropriate way of doing it. Certainly if you're dealing with um, more sensitive or, or, or truly, truly uh, difficult conversations, the survey is not going to cut it. Um, I think we just need to be aware that uh, we can't always uh, uh, rely on the fact that uh, these open open forums uh, are truly representative of how the public feels. Uh, so uh, I would support proactive outreach. Katie? This is an incredibly important consideration and an area where I believe we can make some improvements. To answer this question, I had conversations with Amherst media representatives as well as the town hall staff to discuss what is already being done and to assess feasibility of some of the ideas I have. But before making certain suggest suggestions, my background in research causes me to pause. It is challenging to identify ways that might increase community engagement without having, a baseline, without having the baseline data that helps to identify who is and who is not engaging and why or why not. I would advocate that an important first step would be to gather data to identify the barriers of engagement which would then inform the best approach to increase engagement. 
Tools that can sample a portion of Amherst's population do exist and can be tailored to find out the information that we seek. In the meantime, I would suggest we follow the lead of our leadership. Getting out into the community is an important first step. Events like the monthly Cup of Joe with Mr. Bockelman or office hours with district representatives is a start to connecting with residents. In talking with Amherst Media, I understand that while there are logistical considerations, it is feasible to take school committee meetings on the road and offer them at various locations. Going to the people might help foster public comment from those less traditionally represented and, would op and as would offering interpretation services for portions of the meetings. Especially now with our dual language program, I would also advocate that school committee agendas and meeting, min meeting minutes be made available in Spanish. Thank you, Heather. Thank you for this question. This issue is the backbone to me. We are better together and that means all of us. I feel I'm here, oh, I noticed on the school committee page, we have an email for feedback. I'd love to set up an anonymous Google form to give feedback as well because there are people in our community that do not trust us or the administration as it were. Speaking up or out can, and sadly sometimes does, have a retaliatory response. Historically and presently, there are strong reasons why some of us don't trust authority. An anonymous Google form is a way of lifting up a voice that is important to be heard. Having access to translators and making our meetings, if not translated in real time, but then the translation subtitled on the website would be a step towards more inclusivity as well. I heard a current school committee member talk of being at one of the family nights at an elementary school. I would like us to be present at the schools on their community nights, perhaps even with a table and information and a couple of us available to talk to the parents, increasing our visibility and accessibility. I would love also to have input from our students. They talk about like engaging their voice and hearing what they could use or need or what's working, what's not working, either through a Google form or a feedback box. And in my dream, with no budget, I would love us to throw family student appreciation cookouts at Groff Park, Mill River, and War Memorial to come together as community, celebrate, and be more visible. Ultimately, finding ways to reach out differently, offering childcare, transportation, perhaps going into the communities and being available is going to be necessary to gain more input and more inclusivity in our community. Thank you. Gaston. Yes, Thank you. Um, yeah, I love the idea of having more more parties. The the feeling of community at the um, events that do occur is is fantastic, and uh, I would love to see that magnified. I want to speak in particular to getting constructive and critical feedback from families. I um, have no trouble reaching out to a principal and requesting a meeting because I have a concern about a classroom. Um, but I've spoken to many of my um, kids' friends' parents. And I know that they are not comfortable doing that. And so this is a problem to solve because this is feedback that is essential to succeeding. Um, it is important to know what parents are experiencing and what their children are experiencing. And I, I think that there's a gap of information. So I think it's a question of setting the goal and then being creative. So let me just kind of brainstorm with you for a second. I can imagine um, meeting parents at drop off with an iPad that has like six options of different kinds of issues. Would you like to have somebody reach out to you about this, that, or that, and you kind of initiate the contact. It's, in, it's an invitation to uh, reach out. You meet um, parents at the bus stops. Um, yes, it takes effort, it would take time, um, but it's an important turn to make from parents who are simply not used to uh, raising critical questions about the experience of their children, and it's essential information to succeed in the school system. Okay. Thank you. We're now going to go to con concluded comments. And again, we're limiting you to, did I skip Gaston again? No, okay, that's an old me message, thank you. Um, we're gonna go to concluding statements. And in this case, we'll begin with Katie and you're limited to two minutes, thank you. I wanna thank you all for this opportunity and the time that you've put in this process even amongst the COVID-19 challenges. As I outlined in my opening statement, my objective this evening has been to demonstrate that my skills, my knowledge, and my experience situate me as the best candidate to fill the vacancy at this time. 
As we all know, we are at an incredible point in our town's history. We need to consider how the elementary school building project intersects with other townwide infrastructure demands and the importance of prioritizing our schools in the capital plan. The person you choose tonight should be ready to not only swear in tomorrow, but to hit the ground running. I'm well versed on what's been happening and I'm ready to work collaboratively with the team to do the difficult work in the months ahead. I love Amherst schools and I want to work to retain what's great about them while continuously addressing our challenges. I wanna support our wonderful teachers and students and I wanna see a successful elementary school building project that unites the town. I ask that you provide me that opportunity by voting for me this evening. Thank you very much. Heather. In closing, I wanna thank all the candidates for putting yourselves forward to serve. I thank you Amherst Town Council and Amherst School Committee for your commitment to Amherst and the Amherst Schools. I'm grateful for the opportunity to come before you as a candidate for the Amherst School Committee. In your consideration, please know that I'm a hard worker familiar with education from varying perspectives. I live and breathe social justice and racial equity. I commit to always bring my best self. And if there's a deficit in my knowledge, I'll do the work to fill in that gap in my understanding. I bring all my experiences, education, understanding and passion to the table to serve the Amherst schools and look forward to working together with you all to be the best versions of ourselves we can be. Thank you. Thank you. Gaston. So let me say again, I'm you know, humbled by the, the contributions and perspectives of uh, my fellow candidates. And uh, my main point I wanna to make to the town council and the school committee is that you know, I'm at your service. If it's uh, to serve on the school committee or in any other respect that uh, you would like to ask for my help, um, I'm uh, very keen to provide the assistance that I can with the skills and, and perspective that I bring to the table. As far as serving on the committee, um, I, would, I enjoy uh, bringing fun to service. I like to uh, work with people and, and enjoy the experience. And so you will get uh, someone who is committed and um, brings a light touch to hard work. Thank you. Uh, Ryan. Uh, yeah, I second that. Um, I, I, uh, uh, I'm appreciative of the privilege to uh, have the opportunity to speak with the town council and the school committee tonight. Uh, I thank the school committee for their dedication. I thank the town council for their dedication to Amherst uh, and leading us through this uh, new form of government. Uh, thank you to the candidates who uh, chose to step forward. Uh, as Gaston said, uh, uh, I'm here to help in any way I can. If you feel like I'm a good fit for the school committee, I, it would be a privilege to serve and I would approach it with uh, the utmost uh, amount of professionalism and uh, do everything I can to make sure that things continue to move forward. Uh, I want to thank the teachers, the facility managers, the administrators who took their time to share uh, their experiences with me coming into tonight. Uh, and on a personal note, I'd like to thank my wife, uh, Charlotte, for her support and uh, for encouraging me to pursue this opportunity. And I'd like to thank uh, my mom, Mary, and both my sisters who have always been there and who I suspect are watching right now. Thank you. Before we take a break, I just want to thank all four candidates. And let me just say, I know we have a tough choice ahead of us. Uh, each of you has worked hard to come forward with your statements, your answers to your questions. I encourage all of you, no matter what the outcome, to consider running in the future for the school committee or some other position in town and to remain active in our community. So with that, we're going to take a 10 minute break. We'll, we will come back and reconvene at 7.15. No, 7.45, 7.45. Thank you.
as you return, please um, let us see that you're back. I think you should call make once you're ready how do you repeat the thing? I can't hear you because you're breaking up. Alyssa, was that you? Okay. I'm going to uh, first of all ask that the candidates not only mute, but actually turn their video off. Okay. Thank you. And then I'm going Zoom, to go. Could through you repeat that? that? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Could you repeat what you just said? Yes, I asked the candidates to mute and turn their video off. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to go through the tally vote or I'm sorry, the roll call just to make sure everybody's connected again. Uh, Peter Demling. Present. Ben Harrington. Present. Allison McDonald. Present. Carrie Spitzer. Present. Chal Chalini. Present. Alyssa. Present. Pat. Present. Darcy. Present. Lynn Greesmer. Present. Mandy Joe. Present. Dorothy. She's not in her chair. Okay, I'll come back to Dorothy. Evan. Present. George. Present. Kathy. Present. Steve. Present. Andy. Present. Sandy. I mean, Sarah. I'll answer to anything. I'm here. Present. Thank you. I'm sorry about that. Dorothy, have you returned? There she is. Dorothy, can you just unmute and make sure you're still connected properly? Present. Okay. The next period in our agenda is optional. School committee members and town councilors may wish to speak to candidates' qualifications in relationship to the published description of the board responsibilities and expectations. But we ask that you not express which candidate you intend to vote for. I will ask that you are going to use the raise the hand that's in you you have to have the participants listed and you have to have the raise hand function off to the right just make sure you can see that and let me know if you cannot school committee is going to go first please use the raised hand function to let me know if you would like to speak and I, I will call on you in the order that your hands are raised. When I have called on you, please unmute your mic, make your observation, and then mute your mic. And then after that, I'll go on to the town council. So is there anybody from the school committee at this time who would like to make an observation or comment, et cetera? Peter, please unmute. Okay, can you hear me all right? Yes. Okay, so um, uh, I wanna first thank all the candidates again for applying. Uh, as we all know, it's not easy to run for office in this town, uh, more so in the middle of a crisis and even more so in this particular format of open evaluation without the privacy of a voting booth. So truly thank you everyone for, for stepping up um, and making this a robust process. Um, so you know, with respect to matching up the candidates to the published description, 
of the board responsibilities and expectations. Um, I've heard many good things from all the candidates tonight, uh, as well as in their statements and in emails we've received from the public, um, that there's no way I could cover here. Um, I, you know, I do want to share why I find myself particularly impressed uh, with how well Heather Lord matches what I think the school committee uh, needs right now. Um, I like that she's an Amherst resident, a graduate of our high school, uh, a lifetime Amherst resident, excuse me, a graduate of our high school, a former Marks Meadow Crocker Farm and middle school parent, a former resident and parent of Amherst high school students and a current Amherst high school parent, which has been complemented by her volunteer and work experience in our schools on the Marks Meadow PGO, her Marks Meadow and Wildwood internships for her master's in ed focused on multicultural education, substitute teaching here for the last decade and her recent Fort River internship as school adjustment counselor for her master's in social work. That's a lot of direct and lived experience as a student, parent and staff member in our schools that I think would really help broaden the perspective of the committee. Um, I like her six years of experience on Amherst racial equity and her social justice work uh, in the schools through UROC. Now I've had the chance to attend some of those UROC events and I've seen that Heather is not afraid to ask the hard questions or have uncomfortable conversations. Uh, on the contrary, I've seen her demonstrate that the practical work of undoing racism requires listening to the lived experience of others and then constructively but firmly engaging with those in power. I think that would be a really valuable voice at our table. Uh, I like her unambiguous support for the One Building, One Project compromise proposal that, and I like that it comes after having voted no before for the school committee to be able to demonstrate a, a coalition. Um, and given that our committee's just unanimously voted to extend his contract, I like that she's expressed clear and strong support for the performance and leadership of our current superintendent. Uh, you know, we have a new and very difficult fiscal reality ahead of us. There's no sugarcoating that. And I think we're going to need a school committee united with the superintendent on this particular front so that there's no doubt with the public about the urgency to replace both Fort River and Wildwood as soon as possible. And I see Heather's voice as a big part of our being able to communicate that message as broadly as possible. Um, and finally, I, I love the letters we've received that speak so highly of her kind heart and compassion to help others. Uh, and just to quote from one that really resonated with me, uh, she is a creator of events that hold meaning to families often not heard from and understands the struggles many families face. She is sought out by community members because of her ability to connect. You know, we talk so much about outreach and rightfully so, I think that uh, hers would be a really valuable voice in our committee. Thank you. Are there other comments from school committee members? Please raise your hand. Allison McDonald. Hi, thank you. I, there's a, a lot of us to go through and, and it'll be a very, very long night. So I'm not going to speak very much other than to echo the, the gratitude for these four um, eminently qualified, strong candidates um, that have stepped forward in this um, in this time you, when you submitted your statements of interest, we were just getting into the, um, this crisis and it is um, a big road ahead of us. And, and so I appreciate um, the courage that you've had and the willingness for you to serve, that, serve our town and our students. Um, and that's, uh, I, like I said, I wanna hear from uh, other folks, but I just wanted to say thank you very much. We have a really tough decision tonight. Thank you. Harry. Thank you. I also want to keep my comments brief, but I would like to state that I was highly impressed by all four of the candidates who stepped forward and I want to encourage everybody who, who, who stepped forward tonight to, you know, not be discouraged. We can only choose one person tonight and I hope that everybody will continue to be engaged and, um, you know, look towards other ways of serving both the schools and the town of Amherst. So I just want to thank everyone and um, I'll keep it at that. Is there anybody else from the school committee? Ben, yes. Yeah, I kind of just wanted to echo everyone else's sentiments. Thank you all for uh, for putting yourselves forward. It's definitely not an easy task. And uh, based on what I see here tonight, this is going to be a very difficult decision. And I, I think we came up with four very, very well-qualified candidates here. So thank you for all putting yourselves forward. 
Any other comments from school committee members? Ben, please take your hand down. Thank you. Okay, uh, we're now going to move to town council members and comments. Dorothy, you have your hand up. Please unmute, yes. Right, I, I think I did not understand what you said in the directions. Um, I thought you said we were not to indicate who we were going to vote for. I did ask that you not do that. Okay, so I, I see. Public speaking. Okay. Well, thank you. So is that going to hold? I would prefer that it hold, but um, this is an opportunity to weigh your interests or your, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, to talk about candidate qualifications. Okay. Well, um, I have a lot to say, but I won't say it all now. Um, but I do think that one of the biggest I mean, again, I, I agree with everybody. I, I think that it's a very talented group of people and I hope that all of them can play, continue to play and, and a, a larger role in our school system because um, it was a very rich field. But I think that some of the biggest challenges we're going to have are in fact financial, dealing with the financial fallout of the coronavirus. And so I think that that's one of the things that we have to look for um, in a, a, another school committee member to make sure that they can handle the intense work that is going to be going on, not in terms of just of the regular budget of the school system, but also in terms of how to get the best building that we can afford, which is going to be a real challenge. Because I don't think we want to make the mistake that I gather was made in the past of saving money by getting two, getting one plan and putting it in two schools. And you know, I taught in an open classroom school and we didn't have the problems that these do. So obviously there were some money could have been spent better or maybe it was this was a cheaper way to do it but it's going to be a very big challenge to make the school the town deserves with the money that we will have at our disposal so i think um, the candidate with financial experience is greatly uh, wanted uh sarah schwartz you have your hand up so i also wanted to say how impressed i was with all four candidates and I also wanted to say that maybe we could have more specific um, direction on what we are or are not supposed to ask or say about people's qualifications because for me I don't know that I felt that it was um, all that helpful or appropriate to have someone on the school committee who was so powerful basically just campaign for one person. Okay. Um. Kathy? Thank you. Um, you know, I, I don't, am, am I un Kathy, you're not unmuted. I, it says hi. Um, I, I, I just want to start off saying is, um, as I listened to the four and took notes, I thought, too bad we can only pick one. Um, and then my second thought is, as we deal with the substantial issues that are going to be facing the schools in the coming 21 months, I'm hoping we can find a role for the other three, whoever the other are. So I think the key to me um, fitting with what the role the school committee is going to play is around fiscal. Um, we have not faced the kind of fiscal crisis that the schools are going to face, thankfully for quite a, a long time and it's going to be living with uncertainty based on what I heard at the state level today. We won't know yet um, and we might not know for a few months what the health of the state budget is going to be. So living with what do we, how do you live with that in uh, you're going to still have to run the school system. Um, so I, I think it's really important that on day one the person who comes in understands the complexity of the regional school system budget as well as the elementary school budget. Plus, 
we're trying to build a new school and we really want to keep that project moving forward and there are a series of decisions that are going to have to be made and you want the full support of the superintendent as he's making those decisions but also trying to be creative about it so the school committee members can play different roles as as to move that project forward so i think we need an all hands on deck and we really need the type of skills and insight that's in combination with a true love of Amherst, um, you know, that wasn't put in the school committee. You've got to love the town, but you've got to love the town, love the teachers, love the students, and love being an educator and the role, what education can be. So, so I think we're looking for a, a fit that might not be the same fit we would have looked at for a year ago. Thank you. Um, Shalini, you have your hand up. Yes. Um, again, this is going to be such a difficult decision to make. I wish we could vote for all four. And again, I'm sure there are opportunities for everyone to to participate. Um, that being said, um, what I mean, we, we all are in agreement that some of the important things that are going to uh, be front and foremost are the budget, the the building, and then the community engagement and hearing all the skills in education um, of, in the candidates, I think we can agree that it's, to me, it feels like everyone had the skills, everyone has the educational background, has the experiences, has a willingness, and as Kathy pointed out, a love for, for this town. And I, I saw that in each one of you. So um, the one thing that uh, I'm looking for now in, in addition to all of this that's there is, what is the lived experiences of people? What, what, what is the lens that people are, can offer in the midst of this uncertainty and crisis? And this is not something that can be taught in any school. This has to come from the individual's own lived experiences, their own diversity, their own background, and their sensitivity to, to certain populations or different populations that education cannot teach. So I really encourage us to look at the candidates and see who amongst them can engage different parts of our community that may not have a voice or that are not reflected in the budget making and so forth. Um, yeah, that's all for now. Thank you. Are there any other counselors who have comments at this time? I'm seeing none. And so I'm going to take that. We're going to move on to the tally vote. Okay. Um, this is a roll call vote. Uh, the winning candidate requires a majority of votes of the remaining filled seats on both boards. Absences and abstentions at the meeting do not affect this requirement. Therefore, the number of votes required for the successful candidate is nine. We will then proceed to a roll call vote starting with the school committee and then the town council. This will be done in alphabetical and rotating order for each group. If on the first roll call vote, no candidate receives the required number of votes, then the process will be repeated until a candidate receives a majority of votes as defined above. The council president and the chair of the school committee may choose to have an additional period of comment. And after the vote is completed, there will be a motion to appoint the winning candidate. When you state your candidate, we do not want statements of additional support. Just name the name of the person that you are supporting, okay? So we will start this time with uh, Peter Demling. Please oh, Lord. Mute, state your candidate's name and then go back to mute. Yeah. Heather Lord. Ben Harrington. Katie Lazdowski.
Justin, are you there? There. You look frozen. Katie Lazdowski? No, I got Ben. I got okay. you. Allison, you need to unmute. Oh, I am. Sorry, I didn't hear you call my name. Um, okay. Uh, so, Allison McDonald, um, uh, Heather Lord. Okay. Carrie Spitzer. Heather Lord. Shalini Malmel. Heather Lord. Al Alyssa Brewer. Heather Lord. Pat DeAngelis. Katie Lestowski. Darcy Dumont. Katie Lestowski. Lynn Griesmer is Heather Lord. Mandy Jo Haneke. You need to unmute. I know, it wasn't working. Um, Gaston De Los Reyes. Dorothy Pam. Katie Lazdowski. Evan Ross. Heather Lord. George Ryan. Heather Lord. Kathy Shane. Katie Lustowski. Steve Schreiber. Steve Schreiber. Heather Lord. Andy Steinberg. Heather Lord. Sarah Schwartz. Katie Lostowski. It's going to be good. Okay, I have 10 votes for Heather Lord, six votes for Katie Ladowski, and one vote for Gaston. I would like to make a motion that Heather Lord be appointed to the vacancy on the school committee for the period of the rest of this term. Is there a second? Second, second. Shalini. Chalini has made a second. Is there any other discussion? Could the motion be for the, we had a draft motion. Can I read that? Please, thank you, because <laughs> I, I couldn't find my draft motion today. Thank you. To, to select Heather Lord, a registered voter of the town of Amherst to perform the duties of a member of the Amherst School Committee until newly elected members of the Amherst School Committee are sworn in on January 3rd, 2022. And that is the motion and it's been seconded. And is there any further discussion? Then I'm going to do a roll call vote so that we see where we are in our final vote. This time I will start with Ben Harrington. Say yay or nay. Yay. Allison McDonald. McDonald, yay. Gary Spitzer. Yay. And Peter Demling. Demling, yay. And Alyssa Brewer. Yay. Pat DeAngelis. Unmute Pat. 
Yay. Darcy Dumont. Oh, uh, what are we voting on? <laughs> You're voting on the motion to have Heather Lord fill the vacancy that, since she received a, a majority of the votes. Okay, yay. Lynn Griesmer is yay. Mandy Jo Haneke. Yay. Dorothy Pam. Abstain. Evan, Evan Ross. Yay. George Ryan. Yay. Kathy Shane. Yay. Steve Schreiber. Yay. Andy Steinberg. Yes. Sarah Schwartz. Yay. And Shalini Balmil. Yay. The vote is 16, four, zero against, one abstention, no absences. Heather, we would like to thank you. If you'd like to unmute and just allow yourself to be seen by the public. Thank you. Very much, Heather. This has been a difficult process. I wanna thank all of the candidates. Again, we wanna see all of you active in our schools. We wanna see you all active in our towns. And if we could have picked four, it would have meant some other people would have had to go off the committee and we don't want that either. So have a good evening. Thank you for all your efforts to come together for this very special meeting. The meeting is adjourned.